And actually, it's kind of perfect because we're going to go to our next speaker. So we're going to go from data to talking about health and healthcare. And that's really fitting because you would think that with all this data out there, we can use it to innovate healthcare. That's the hope, anyway. Uh, this next speaker isn't only hoping, however. He's not only accomplished professionally, he is the global marketing director of Intel, uh, but he is also a fighter. Having battled late stage cancer for a number of years, he has pushed innovation and used innovative technology and data to bring together personalized healthcare for better results. It's going to be very interesting for him to hear about his story, his history, and how genomics can change everything. Please give a warm, warm welcome to Bryce Olson. Hi, everybody. How are you? I want to talk to you about the power of precision medicine. Advances are happening in science and technology today where they're coming together that are so amazing that they are truly revolutionizing the way that we detect disease and how we can treat it. This industry, $200 billion industry over the next 10 years, it's big precision medicine. Right now, the folks that are leading this are the United States, China, and some Western European countries. The Americas is lagging right now, but you shouldn't give up hope at all. We are literally in the first minute of a 90-minute soccer game on this. The opportunity is yours, and I, I hope that during my talk today, there are two things that you take away. One is that precision medicine is uniquely important for the Americas, uniquely, and you'll understand why. Uh, second is that I hope I can inspire some of the innovators and entrepreneurs in the room here to like use your skills and talents to help the health and life sciences industries in the different Latin America countries get on board and really make people's lives better who are suffering from disease. So I thought maybe the best way to kind of kick a dialogue off about precision medicine is to maybe explain what precision medicine is not. And precision medicine is not a one-size-fits-all thing. I mean, how many of you, when you go into a store, pick up the same pair of pants as everybody else? How many of you pick up the same shirt as everybody else? You don't. And nor should you get the same medicine if you're suffering from something like cancer. So I had to learn the hard way on this. And my cancer journey started here, actually, in Costa Rica, crushing it on waves, having a blast, living the Pura Vida lifestyle. Everything was going good for me. I, I was like the perfect picture of health. Never got sick, never had to go to the doctor, exercised every day. Matter of fact, I didn't want to go into the doctor. Why would I want to go to the doctor? I'm just going to walk out with something probably worse, right? But what I didn't know is there was something kind of growing inside of me, and it was manifesting itself in my need to pee all the time. So with prostate cancer, it screws up your prostate gland and causes weird urination things. So for me, it was a frequency and an urgency of urination. I don't like to pee in the ocean. The ocean's too beautiful. There's already enough crap in the ocean. It doesn't need my pee, right? But when you're dealing with something like this, you just have to pee all the time. And by the way, I live in Oregon where we have to wear a wetsuit. You don't want to pee in a wetsuit. It's gross. It doesn't, it just sticks in there and it's yuck. So, uh, but if I wanted to have a surf session, I just, I had to. I couldn't help it. I was going to have to let go. And that kind of pushed me when I got back home to the States to do something about it. And so I visited my doctor. And we thought that maybe I just have some kind of urinary tract infection. So I, I peed in a cup, and he looked at it under the microscope. He's like, no. 
So he's scratching his head, I'm scratching my head, and he's like, well, let me check your prostate gland. So he puts on the rubber, you know, glove, smacks it, and I was like, oh, great, we're going there? Really? Like, can you just take me to lunch first? Like, I, I, this isn't what I really counted on today. And he went in there, and that's when everything changed for me, because the prostate is supposed to feel kind of like this, kind of soft, but it felt like my knuckle. And anytime you've got a gland that's super hard, that's not good, right? So that's how my journey with cancer started. If you were born after 1960, you have about a 50-50 shot of actually getting diagnosed with cancer if you live long enough. Think about that. 50-50 cancer. So what does the standard of care look like for people battling cancer today? Well, it's evolving, it's changing because of precision medicine, and I'll talk about that. But for the most part, it's doctor's attempts, if you look at the scalpel and work your way around, it's doctor's attempts to cut, burn, poison, or starve it out of your body in case of prostate cancer, starving it. That's it. It's a one-size-fits-all thing. And this will work if you have early-stage cancer, you know, surgery can remove cancer and then you can be cancer free. But if you have advanced disease where the cancer has metastasized from its tumor of origin and went into bones and organs, this does not get it done. This does not get it done. I know because I went through chemo. Okay, so this is me after my second infusion. My first infusion was so bad. I had so many terrible side effects that I had no choice but to just try to find the humor in this whole thing. So I put on this 80s hairband outfit, looks a little bit like Axl Rose, kind of. What you can't see is the black spandex pants and the pink cowboy boots that I had on. And I found no choice but to just try to find the humor because I needed to jump into a different persona because this was such a crappy experience. And so I went around and I distributed gourmet chocolates to my brothers and sisters in the infusion chairs. And this one older guy, he kind of looks up at me, he's like, are you with the entertainment? And I said, no. He goes, well, do you work here then? And I was like, no, man, I'm just like you. And I pointed to the IV in my arm that I was dragging around. But I really wished I wasn't, because I was quickly learning how much of a bummer it is to be cruising around in cancer land when all you can rely on is the standard of care. By early 2015, my cancer was growing again. I probably got about nine months out of chemo, like extending my life, but I paid for it with six months of chemo-induced sickness. Blistering mouth sores, epic fatigue, neuropathy in my feet. That's why I wear these sweet Nike kicks, because I can't really feel my feet that well from neuropathy. And it was around this time that studies were coming out, and it was showing that if you have, I don't know, metastatic disease to the bone and you have progressed on chemo, meaning that the cancer slipped away and it's growing despite having chemo, you have about a median survival of 21 months. 21 months. That blows. That totally sucks. 21 months. And it was at this time where I started to come to terms with my own mortality. Like, I didn't think I would see my kid even get out of elementary school. And, by the way, I don't know if any of you have ever come to terms with your own mortality, but it's a dark place, okay? The way I best describe it is, you feel like you're kind of stuck in time and place, and then you're watching the rest of the world move on and kind of leave you behind, and you can't catch up. You're just stuck. And it makes you question, like, why should I even invest in myself? I got a dentist appointment coming up in three weeks. Ah, screw it. What's the point of shoring up my teeth? I'm not even going to make it. Right? You get into this weird mind funk. So, fortunately for me, I got lucky, and there was some light at the end of the tunnel. So I work at Intel Corporation, a technology company, and I knew that they were helping a variety of different industries address big challenges and make digital transformations that could be really transformative. And I knew they were doing something with the healthcare and the life sciences industry in the segment, but I didn't really know what. But I just pushed my way into that group, and what I learned 
kind of blew my mind because I learned all about genomics and precision medicine. The ability to sift through somebody's DNA and understand what's driving their disease at a unique level. And then that opening up the door to target it was something that's a better fit. So what is precision medicine? This is probably the simplest way that I could probably describe it to you. So do you see the guys on the left-hand side? Those are cancer patients that are going through medicine of the present. Essentially, they all get the same treatment, and then some people do well, have a good effect, some people have no effect, and then some people have an actual bad effect, like they have a bunch of side effects, and then the cancer actually gets worse, okay? So precision medicine would look at the problem different. It would say, okay, let's look at all these people and then segment them out. Let's identify what's driving their disease at a molecular level. Let's do, look at their blood, and let's do DNA sequencing, and RNA sequencing, which is the expression of a screwed up gene, and seeing if it's doing something, and then give them a drug that's a better fit, the right drug at the right time for the right person. And when you do that, everybody benefits because you've personalized things for them. So I also learned that genomic sequencing is really you know, looking at the order of the DNA building blocks that make you who you are. DNA sequencing is looking at all the A's and the C's and the T's and the G's, essentially these four letters. And if you do whole genome sequencing, there's like three billion base pairs of these, six billion letters. It's a massive amount of data. So if you're into big data, this is some of the biggest of big data. And what you want to do is you want to look to see what are the screwed up mutations that are not in the person's normal blood, for example. So those mutations could be cancer drivers, and you need to understand what those are so then you can treat somebody uniquely. Let's take a look at lung cancer specifically, because I want to like help you understand a given cancer, and we'll pick lung cancer. So non-small cell lung cancer, super lethal disease. Non-small cell lung cancer, or any of these cancers, breast cancer, prostate cancer, they're not one disease. You gotta segment them out and look at them at a molecular level. Lung cancer is no different. So lung cancer is actually these various, if you understand what's driving the person's lung cancer, then you can treat them. So the red, KRAS, unfortunately that is not a treatable mutation today. We're still working, scientists are trying to figure this out. And again, this is a mo data, mo beta thing. The more data we have, the higher likelihood we're gonna be able to take AI and find patterns that we can't see today. But KRAS is not very treatable. On the other hand, EGFR and ALK, ALK, mutant lung cancers, there are good treatments out there today that can extend people's life with non-small cell lung cancer. There are not only first line treatments, but second line and even third line treatments are emerging now, meaning that you take the first line drug and it works for a while, then your cancer starts to grow again. There are second line drugs that can figure out what is mutated, that they're built for that. They know what's mutated off of an EGFR inhibitor and then allow you to treat it. Now, why is this important for the Americas? Well, turns out Latin American ethnicity, Latin American people, American people, you guys have higher percentages of EGFR mutant lung cancers. White people only have like 10 to 15% of lung cancers EGFR mutant. Latin Americans have somewhere between 20 and 30. And if you're from Peru, which has a higher level of Asian ancestry in those people, up to 60% of their lung cancers can sometimes be EGFR. So you really need to understand this. So at this point I'm like, okay, God, I'm learning about all these institutions that Intel's working with to help them make all these new discoveries. And I'm wondering, like, why is nobody sequencing me? This is ridiculous. I need to understand what's driving my disease. So I knew that the path to precision medicine started with pathology. And so I went to my pathologist and my oncologist, and I had two words for him. I said, sequence me. Let's do this. And it turned out that I had clinically significant mutations as well. So a clinically significant mutation means you have a mutation that there's a drug on the other end that's built for that screwed up mutation. So in my case, I had 
hyperactivity in this thing called the PI3K pathway. So let me explain in simple terms what this means. So prostate cancer on the cell surface of these cells are these little receptors. They're like androgen receptors. That's what they are. They're androgen receptors. And so for prostate cancer, androgen receptors feed off of testosterone. It's like a mouth. It's looking to feed off of something. So one of the first line treatments that I mentioned earlier is starve. So they starve, take testosterone out of your body. But prostate cancer is so damn smart that it figures out how to take glucose, or sorry, uh, cholesterol, and it can take uh, cholesterol and like glucose, and it can convert it into something that looks like testosterone. So it can continue to feed, okay? So when prostate cancer feeds off of this, it folds into the nucleus of the cell, and it picks, in my case, this PI3K pathway to proliferate. Because cancer is just crazy proliferation of cells. It's rapid division of cells. Most pathways have what's called a tumor suppressor gene. It's like a traffic cop. But mine, which was P10, I had P10 copy number loss. So that was another thing that they informed me is like, your pathway is screwed up and the tumor suppressor gene is screwed up. So it's like a freeway of activity. So the analogy that I like to use is paying homage to the late, great Burt Reynolds. You guys see Smokey and the Bandit? Yeah? Okay. So Bandit and Cletus hauling ass, delivering beer from Texas to Georgia because Coors beer was illegal. Okay? So they pick this pathway and they're hauling, right? Meanwhile, you got Buford T. Justice and Junior who are arguing and screwing around and they're on the side of the road and they're not even paying attention as Bandit and Cletus bring all that beer in. That's the tumor suppressor gene, okay? So that's what I was dealing with. So with that insight, I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. I can get off the, the one-size-fits-all train. I can actually go and find a drug that would be a good fit for me. So uh, I knew that these, or at least I got onto clintrials.gov. By the way, as an innovator, if you want to figure out how to help people, create a better match.com for people like me, right? Because clintrials.gov is not good. It's hard to navigate. But anyway, clintrials.gov showed that there was about seven or eight different phase one PI3K inhibitors that were being tested. So I called up the principal investigator at one of them at Cedar sinai in LA, because I like to surf, and they got fun ocean in California. So I called her and I said, I want into your trial. And she said, oh, thank you very much, but there's no space available. I said, yeah, but I got genomic sequencing data. You have what? I have genomic sequencing data. I know I'm a perfect molecular match to the drug you're trying to test. Wow. Nobody's ever called us with that before. Um, could you come down and get evaluated? We'd love to have somebody in our, in our cohort that's actually a perfect match for the drug. We've been trying to push the drug company to do this, but they haven't. So I went in, I became eligible, started the drug in March of, of 15, and I shut it down for two years when nothing else worked. I literally shut that thing down for two years. That's the power of precision medicine. This stuff is like catching on fire now in the United States, right? So patients are waking up to it. By the way, all these articles that you're seeing, this is two years old. This is not new. This has been in the, on the newsstands for quite a while. Matter of fact, if, all of, if some of you are flying home later this week, when you're at the airport, go to the newsstand and you'll see that the cover, the whole article, the whole magazine for National Geographic this week is about precision medicine. So it's like a big thing, right? And it's not just patients that are waking up to this. Hospitals are getting on board. The Miami Cancer Institute, they have a state-of-the-art lab for genomics. They're partnering with industry, right? They're sequencing cancer patients and they're partnering with industry. They just announced a couple months ago a big partnership with Philips for their Intella Space Genomic Health Platform. Moffitt Cancer Center, same thing. They're making major advance advancements in genomics. So you have a base here in Florida of companies that are innovating in the space and they have all of Latin America that they could really help out, right? So I'll talk about the opportunities here in just a sec. And by the way, responses are better. It's just proven. Even back like in 2016, there was a study that JAMA Oncology did, and they looked at 300 phase one clinical trials. And guess what happens when you recruit people and you have a biomarker selection strategy? Your patients do better. And so what that means is they looked at the trials where they were recruiting patients 
who were molecular matches to the drug they were trying to test versus ones that were just randomly bringing in people. 6x better response rates for those with a biomarker selection strategy. OK, so we're at this new era, this new genomic era of medicine. And like I said, Americas are kind of a little bit behind right now, but there's plenty of opportunity to catch up. But the first thing that you have to do is you've got to sequence your people. Your patients suffering from diseases like cancer across the Americas, you have to sequence them. I mean, this is why this is really important. In 2009, they looked at these genomic-wide association studies. And these genomic-wide association studies are where they pool all these genomes. And then people get involved, and they research this. And drug companies are involved. And they're trying to identify the unmet need and new disease drivers. In 2009, they did a, an analysis of all the genomes that were in these studies. At that point, 1.7 million samples. 96% of them were European ancestry, white people, right? Flash forward to 2016, 35 million samples now. These, this stuff's exponentially just blowing up. At that point, about 80% of the samples were Western, you know, European ancestry, white people. 20% of them weren't. But the 20% are predominantly Asian, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. You know what percentage are Latin American? Less than one. The reason why this is really important is because even if that 1% turned into two or three or four, there's no Latin American genotype. Latin Americans are some of the most diverse people on the planet. You are arguably the most diverse people on the planet. If you look at this, this is just looking at the dominant ethnic groups in a given country. So when you look at Mexico, it makes you feel like, okay, well, must be everybody must be mestizo, right? This mix of, of European and original Indian. But even when you look at Mexico, it's not that way. The northern states like Sonora, they're about like, you know, more European, 60% of the, if you look at a person's genome, the average person is about 60%. European and, and about you know, 30% or whatever American Indian. You go to the southern states, like Guerrero and, and Yucatan and Veracruz, it's the opposite. They're like 30% European, and the rest of it is other. So you really need to look at people individually to understand what they are. Look at Brazil. Look how diverse that is. On the eastern side, a lot of African. On the south, more European. In the middle, it's a mix a mix of mestizo and just original Indian population. Bolivia, a huge population of original people. You're incredibly diverse, and we need to learn more about you because disease manifests itself differently in ethnic diverse people. Have you guys heard of the BRCA mutation? Remember Angelina Jolie? She was BRCA mutant. Her mom died of breast cancer, or I think it was ovarian cancer, I, I forget. But she found out through just germline sequencing, doing a, a, a genetic predisposition to disease test, that she was BRCA BRCA mutant. So she prophylactically took action. She removed her breast and had her ovaries yanked out, right? So turns out when you look at the BRCA variants in Latin Americans, they're different, right? We need to study those so we can turn around and make the right type of treatments that would, be, that would help somebody that's from Latin America. OK, so in kind of the last little bit of time that I have here, um, so what can you do? What can you do as entrepreneurs and innovators out there? Well, the first thing you need to do across Latin America is digitize your health records. Right? This is kind of that you need a digital foundation. If you go into the hospital and the doctor's office and everything's in little binders and it's all paper-based, that's not going to be helpful, right? So in, a, in the US, this is a, we just did this, by the way. In the, in the United States, uh, probably over the last five years now, we're at about 80% of um, uh, electronic medical records, maybe 90% of electronic medical records are digital, OK? In Latin America, different countries, it's kind of a hit or miss. Some countries have national mandates to do this. Some are moving a little bit slower, but you need this digital foundation. The second thing is invest in genomics, OK? G genomics is the new oil. This data is incredibly valuable. And some places are doing this better than others. 
If you look at like Mexico, Carlos Slim has put hundreds of millions of dollars working with the Broad Institute of MIT Harvard up in Cambridge to study ethnic variation of Latin Americans and to understand what's driving disease. They've made all kinds of new discoveries. They've identified unique drivers of diabetes that are unique to Latin Americans. Same with cancer, other diseases. Uh, in Mexico, you also have the, the National Institute of Genomic Medicine. You know, they're partnering with different places in the United States. Why? Because they have a foundation. They're investing strategically in genomics. And that gets to the third issue, which is foster collaboration, okay? If you sequence people in your country with cancer and you start amassing this data set, all of a sudden you're very interesting to all the innovators in this space that are wanting to get access to that to transform medicine. So whether it's diagnostic testing companies like Gardent or Grail or Epic Sciences or Natera or Invite, you know, all these companies that are doing diagnostics on molecular data. If you have data on your people, they'll want to collaborate with you. People that are doing clinical decision support on this genomic data. You know, there's a lot of companies that are doing that now too, where they can look at the data in the electronic medical record of a patient, combine the genomic data, and then determine what would be the right treatment to give somebody. If you have that data, they'll want to partner with you. Leverage your diversity. You are unique. Latin Americans are unique. That, is, that alone is something that all these people that are trying to make new discoveries on the unmet need are going to want to partner with you if you step up and start driving this space. And then lastly, embrace AI for value-based care. So this is where I think certain countries in Latin America are going to have an advantage over the United States as well. In the US, we have perverse incentives for healthcare. The healthcare industry is built on fee for service, okay? What that means is in the United States, they build a hospital, they put a bunch of equipment in the hospital, and then they want to make revenue off of that. It's revenue cycle management. It's not about outcomes, it's about revenue maximization. That's fee for service. Fee for value looks at the problem differently. Fee for value says, we want to prevent illness in our people, we want to focus on outcomes and cost, you change the motivation and then you change the design. I think there's certain countries in the Americas where you have a universal healthcare. You don't have necessarily the money to go out and do all these services. You want to predict, you want to prevent, you want to preempt illness from happening. That is where you need AI and all this data to find patterns that the human eye can't see. So for countries like that, embrace AI for value-based care. For any of you in the audience who are either going through cancer or have family members or friends that are going through cancer, and if it's advanced cancer, just demand sequencing. Go in and demand it. This was from a video that I did with Teletica in Costa Rica. And again, open up new doors, because if you have advanced cancer, the standard of care does not get it done. And you need to open new doors, because opening up new doors, once you're a patient and you've opened up new doors with this, you become incredibly empowered. You become engaged in your own care. And I don't know, like I can tell you when I was going through the standard of care, I was not empowered. I was not engaged. But once I understood it was driving my disease at a molecular level, my engagement meter went up to 11, right? Like that engagement meter went to 11, spinal tap reference. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, uh, you can go to intel.com slash healthcare. Uh, you can also go to my sequenceme.org site. Um, and by the way, if you want one of these baller t-shirts, uh, we're selling them there too, and all the proceeds go to Children's Cancer Association, a nonprofit in Oregon. Um, and this will talk, teaches you about sequencing. It teaches you from a patient's perspective. There's a battle card that you can take in and, and have a dialogue with your doctor so you don't, get this, you don't get stuck in this kind of paternalistic thing where the doctor's here and you're here. Um, and lastly, let me just say, like, all of you innovators and entrepreneurs in the room, there's a silver bullet that's going against disease, and it's you guys. Seriously. Like, use your skills and experience to help the healthcare industry. Use your, 
amazing technology, your ability to predict things for other industries, your ability to do preventive things for other industries. Bring it to healthcare, right? Help people like me see another sunset, right? Help people like me experience another summer vacation. Help people like me explore and do more surfing. Thanks. <laughs>